What I'd like to talk about just for a second is why I write about science. I'm a journalist. I have been for many, many years. I've, been, I've covered politics. I've covered uh, the international political scene as a correspondent in Africa and Asia. Uh, I've covered the White House. Uh, I've had a really wonderful and, and rich career. But nothing has been more interesting than covering science. And the reason is because basically all of those things that, that I covered and, you know, was very uh, kind of restless, you know, moving from one topic to another, even my books are, are that way. Um, but it's all unified by one theme, which is a fascination with that moment of discovery and that moment when technology uh, begins to change our society and begins to change individuals. And I... I probably have settled in this uh, for the rest of my career and the rest of my life, uh, meeting the scientists, the, the people on the leading edge of technology. Um, you know, as a correspondent for Nightline, as, as my work on NPR and other places, um, has been a, an incredible privilege. And I think if you look back in time um, as a student of history, these moments when technology and science begin to shift paradigms is, is when civilizations rise and fall. Um, you know, we, we're in a moment like that right now, I believe. It's, a, it's an incredibly important moment. And as a writer and a communicator trying to understand what's happening here and to basically, in some ways, uh, beat people over the head a little bit, uh, not too hard, but um, get them to understand just how important this era is. Uh, just these stories I just described to you, uh, three incredibly important areas all around, swirling around science, and also how we communicate it and talk about it. And I think we have an amazing panel here to give us different points of view. Basically, I think virtually every medium is represented here, uh, from fiction to radio and television. And I'm going to hand it off to the panel here. And let's see here, find the introductions. Uh, start out with Peter Laufer. And Peter is an award-winning independent journalist, broadcaster, and documentary filmmaker. He was a correspondent for NBC News, um, anchored the radio program National Geographic World Talk, and on Sundays still hosts the Peter Laffer Show on the San Francisco Clear Channel radio station Green 960. And he's written for Mother Jones, lots of other magazines, authored several books on a, on a really unbelievably uh, wide variety of topics, including um, a science book, his last one, uh, called The Dangerous World of Butterflies. And I believe he's working on a sequel as well, but Peter, take it away. Okay, it's terrific to be here, and I, I love uh, speaking right after your assessment of how you got into science writing and how you embrace it and how important it is, because I come to it completely by happenstance and have no reason to be on this panel that is legitimate along the lines of the rest of you guys. This book, The Dangerous World of Butterflies, which is absolutely a natural history book, it's a science book, it's science journalism, because of the subject matter. But the reason that I wrote it is that I was in an environment much like this. It was a bookstore signing in Bellingham, Washington, at a terrific independent bookstore, Village Books. And, it, and the speech was shot by, by C-SPAN. And toward the end of the reading, about an hour in, and I imagine you all have had this experience, somebody raised their hand, and it was a hot, miserable day with no air conditioning, and I had a tie on, and I was wired for television, so I couldn't take my jacket off. And somebody asked me what my next book was going to be about. You, you get this question. For some reason, I don't under, quite understand why that question comes. But I, I said, the book I was talking about, which dealt with soldiers coming back from the Iraq War, who came back opposed to the war, and this was a series of profiles of those soldiers, was such a difficult book to research and write. The stories were so hard to listen to that that, that book was so difficult to write emotionally that my next book would be about butterflies and flowers. I have absolutely no clue where that came from. It was an escape line. I needed to get off the stage, and it worked. There was a little titter, as there was just now here in this room. I said, thank you very much. Exit stage left. And then C-SPAN broadcast the, the uh, speech, including that bit. And in the lower third was my email address, website. 
And for the, they recycle these things on C-SPAN often, and so for the next several days, weeks, I was on the receiving end of an avalanche of email. About half of the email said that I was a traitor and should leave the country, and the other half said that this was a heroic book to write to give voice to these guys. And one email in the middle of that said, there was a joke line where you said your next book was going to be about butterflies and flowers. My husband and I operate a butterfly preserve here in Granada, Nicaragua. You were making a joke, but in fact, there's a story there. And the story is here, and if you come down to Nicaragua, we will introduce you to what's beneath the veneer in the butterfly world. And of course, as journalists, we know there's always a veneer. There's a story everywhere. There are no slow news days, only slow news reporters. And, <laughs> and only pushy wives. And my, my wife shoved me onto an airplane. She said, this is too, too good. It's serendipitous. It's a gift from the muse and the news gods. And I went down to this butterfly reserve and in fact was introduced to what became the subject matter of this book, a phenomenal world of smuggling, of organized crime, of extraordinary controversy between those who believe in the captive breeding of butterflies for a variety of reasons and those who oppose it because of their concerns for the purity of the species. Industries that are developing like the butterfly release industry for weddings and funerals. I traveled all over the place, met an amazing array of people, and have learned, in fact, that there is a dangerous world of butterflies. How dangerous? Really dangerous for some people. <laughs> so dangerous. Uh, we have, well, there's a guy in here who did two years in federal prison for bringing uh, butterflies in that are in violation, tra trafficking in them is in violation of international treaty and federal law. Amazing federal fish and wildlife service agent who tracked this guy for three years went undercover and feigned interest in him, romantic interest, in order to lure him to this country from Japan and arrest him at LAX as he came thinking he was going to have a date with a guy that was also an illegal butterfly trafficker but in fact was a federal cop. That dangerous. <laughs> Well, Peter, thank you, and, and you know, th this is a really good example, in fact, the panel is a good example of taking a subject that literally started as a throwaway line and making a book out of it, and, you know, we, we've all, there, we all know about books about salt and cod and, uh, you know, these, these seemingly, you know, how could a book be that interesting about cod? Well, it turns out, you know, cod was a, a, a major force in history, <laughs> and, you know, making a, a book out of butterflies and fascinating and interesting is part of what being a science writer is all about. And I think we have next there, Douglas Carlton Abrams. As a former editor at the University of California Press in Harper, San Francisco. His first book, The Lost Diary of Don Juan, and before this I was telling him, boy, you've gone a long way from Don Juan. Um, it's been published in 30 countries and it's recently optioned for a film. His new novel is the fact-based eco-thriller, Eye of the Whale. And Doug is also the co-founder of Idea Architects, a book and media development agency that works with the likes of Archbishop Desmond Tutu and primatologist Franz de Waal and another stellar list. So, Doug, from uh, Don Juan to Wales. Uh, well, thank you. It's a privilege to be here and on this panel. And it's great to follow on Peter's comments uh, because um, my journey to writing Eye of the Whale was serendipitous as well. I don't start out with a... Um, with an answer or with a genre, I start out with a question. And in this case, I was uh, sitting one winter morning with my twin daughters, uh, reading them a book about Humphrey the Whale that many of you have probably seen or certainly heard about Humphrey. And a friend of ours was visiting from college who's a public health a PhD, and she was telling me about these quite extraordinary environmental threats that I had not heard about. And the question that occurred as I was sitting there reading to my children was, was there a world, a, a question that I'm sure many of you have asked yourself, is there a world that we're going to be able to give to our children, and what is that world going to be like? And ultimately, is there something stronger in our nature than fear, greed, and ignorance, and denial? And that was the question that really sparked this journey. Uh, it was, uh, the journey took me to swimming with the whales in Tonga, to working with some of the world's leading marine biologists, 
uh, the man who discovered whale song, to swimming with the great white sharks, uh, to uh, working with environmental toxicologists, and um, it was a, an incredible journey. The story is about a, uh, I think we were talk, supposed to tell a little bit about it. I mean, I'm the only, I guess, fiction writer up here. Uh, and it was, one of the things we, we can talk about a little later is the challenge of having a fact-based fiction and the relationship between fact and fiction. But all the, the stories in, all the facts in the novel are actually true. And the places we were pushing the envelope a little uh, were several, we were hypothesizing a couple of things, particularly about whale communication, that were actually found to be true uh, by scientists. They were discovered as I was working on the novel. So that was quite an amazing experience. The story is about a marine biologist who must risk everything to crack the code of humpback whale communication and rescue a trapped whale. And her neonatologist husband, who is discovering that what's happening in the water and happening to animals in the water is also happening on land uh, to our own children. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, many of the things that, you know, the, the facts that are in the novel are the facts of our world, and I think we're going to talk about that some more as well. Thanks very much. Thanks, Doug. And finally, um, at the end there is Susan Frankel, and she's a science writer whose work has appeared in Discover, Reader's Digest, Smithsonian, The New York Times, and others. And she's the author of American Chestnut, The Life, Death, and Rebirth of a Perfect Tree. It's another one of those topics that uh, writers can pull something like a tree and make it fascinating. She's currently working on a book about the world of plastics, uh, which I'm very interested in reading. Um, I guess she turns it in, and we have to wait till the end of next year to... Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. First day, 2011. Um, in 2005, she was awarded an Alicia Patterson Fellowship, which allowed her to conduct the research for American Chestnut. So, Susan. Well, I guess I'm the fourth person here who fell into science writing with no background. Um, and, and listening to you guys talk, um, it reminded me, I come from a science family. My parents were both academic physicians. That goes back, actually, a couple of generations. And um, you know, science was very much a part of growing up and the dinner table conversation. And um, I sort of absorbed it, but I wasn't good at math. I was really bad at math. And I think you know, we live in a world that bisects, and you're either good at math and you go to medical school, or you're bad at math and you go to law school. So that kind of you know, set my path. I wasn't gonna go to medical school, and I ended up not going to law school. Uh, but instead writing about lawyers for a long time. Um, and I fell into science writing through writing about health and medicine, again, just sort of serendipitously. But what I discovered when I started writing about science is I really liked it. I really liked the world of scientists. Um, I liked the way they thought. I liked the kind of passion that most of them brought to their, their work. I liked them much better than lawyers. Um, <laughs> they seemed much more sort of straightforward to me. Um, and, you know, and so I just sort of moved into it um, more and more uh, through the years. And um, this book, um, like others, was kind of a, um, you know, a serendipity. I was working on a story about sudden oak death, which some of you might remember was killing a lot of the oak trees in Northern California in uh, the late 90s. And um, I was working on a story with the scientists who were trying to unravel what it was that was killing the oak trees. And their point of reference, they kept telling me these stories about this earlier epidemic back in the early part of the 20th century, which had wiped out all the American chestnut trees. And I had never heard of American chestnuts. I had never heard of chestnut blight. I, I didn't really know anything about trees, to be quite honest. Um, and uh, But I started talking with people and I started digging around, and I just became fascinated by it. Um, and I wasn't even really sure when I decided to write the book what it was I was so interested in. I kept telling people, you know, it's about a tree, it's about landscape, how landscape changes. You know, it was pretty, pretty boring to most people. Um, and it took me a while in terms of writing and working and researching where I started to realize that what I was really looking at and what was really drawing me in were um, the people who had become kind of enraptured with this tree, whether it was um, the folks in Appalachia who were very connected to the tree and who relied on it very much for their livelihood in the, the um, late 19th century and were just grief-stricken when the trees started to die. And you would you know, read these 
you know, things that were like eulogies when the trees started to die, to the scientists who were trying to figure it out contemporaneously as the trees were dying, or the ones um, who were currently working on it, who were just these people who had put so much of their lives and so much energy into it. I, there was this one guy I write about, um, Phil Rudder, who is, um, he lives in this one room cabin in the northern Minnesota woods and, um, you know, doesn't have running water. His wife says we have walking water. They walk to the well. Um, you know, he, he has, uh, um, uh, he, he has a tree farm and he just, knows everything there is to know about chestnuts and can just sort of go on and on about, you know, why they grow the way they grow. He thinks they're the most fascinating organism on earth and he makes a really good case for why they are. And I, I guess the point that I'm getting at is what, what drew me in and I think what's so interesting and actually incredibly important in terms of um, dealing with the kinds of problems that we have now is that these are scientists who feel a great sense of connectivity to the whole biotic web that we exist in. And they tend to recognize that we are not just, you know, at the top of the food chain, but we're part of this um, web. And that what we do has great impact and that um, how we conduct ourselves in this broader whoops, biotic uh, world has incredible um, influence and incredible importance. Um, so I, I'll stop there. That connects back to your point. No, thank you. and. Um, it's interesting when I, you know, when I heard about your book, uh, it reminded me when I was a very, very small boy growing up in Kansas City. Um, they, you know, it's a, it's a prairie town basically, but they built, they, they um, grew chestnuts all over the city. And I can remember the canopies of, you would go down in any major street in the downtown and it was the shade trees, almost like, it was almost like a cathedral these canopies of, of chestnuts. And then that went away. I mean, I was, I was very little when it happened, so I don't really even remember it, but I could remember when it was brought to my attention that that's gone now. You, know, the, you see the sky, and there are other kinds of trees that tend to grow straight up instead of that, that canopy. So that brought back a particular memory for me. But I wanted to ask the whole panel here, um, you know, I, I think a lot about how um, to communicate science in these stories, and it's very, very difficult at times, uh, whether you're a scientist or a non-scientist, to be able to tell these stories in a compelling way. I mean, you're competing with all the other topics out there. Um, how would you grade science writing right now? I mean, how, how we're doing, and I, fiction as well, I mean, in, in imparting the facts, and also the, I mean, one of the interesting things about science facts, of course, is that they can change. I mean, you know, basic facts seldom do, but uh, they're mostly hypotheses and theories, and they're constantly being challenged and, and changing. And how, how do you think we're doing, Peter? Well, again, I feel, a, I feel, what am I doing here? And, and so let me answer <laughs> well, but it you're slightly a media person. different. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And, and if I could answer it slightly differently, which is how did I, or to answer a slightly different question, how did I approach it since I didn't have any background, I did not come at it figuring I'm going to write a book that deals with science and wanting to make what I was learning, because it was so amazing, accessible as best I could to an audience. And, and so since I started from zero and was on a quest that had been essentially assigned to me that there was something here, and I was finding it out from the beginning, going down to Nicaragua, meeting these people who started to tease me by telling me the things they know, knew and know, and telling me the names of people that I should take a look at and places I should go. I, I made the book into a quest. And, and I go from this moment in this bookstore in Washington State where I make what I think is a marginal joke and it becomes an assignment that I accept. And, and so since I am learning about something I know nothing about, I think it makes it accessible to the reader to join me on this adventure as our knowledge builds. And by the end of the book, I have at least a primer on the world of butterflies, why it's dangerous, what's going on with the butterflies, what the controversies are there. And, and there has been a bit of an adventure along the way for me that the reader can vicariously participate in. And from the standpoint of constructing a book and trying to get a, a sense of how to attract the reader, I am currently in the midst of, of a bit of a problem along the lines of what you address, which is you mentioned there's another book coming along and the book that I'm working on now, which 
is due next month, deals with exotic pets, exotic pets defined as pets that are not native or for some reason or another are unusual to have. Specifically, I'm looking at big cats, uh, long snakes, and great apes. There, there are, for example, as best anybody can tell, more tigers in Texas than in India right now. And, and, and it, it's a bizarre reality. These are captive bred tigers. You can have them in your backyard. There's almost no restriction. So there's story there. There's information there. There's science there. And what I'm trying to grapple with is, how am I going to tell it? Because I, I can't use that trick again. I used it. And, and what, what exactly am I going to do? And this is due next month. This is due next month. So any ideas? <laughs> <laughs> OK. This reminds me of another friend of mine. His book is due next month. And he's still in his third or fourth chapter. But uh, anyway, uh, well, how, you know, as a, a longtime media person, um, and before you started writing about science, you know, you, you read the stories. How, how, do, you, how do you think we're, we're doing it, uh, getting the message out there? I, I think we're doing pretty well in getting the message out there. And part of it, I think, is, is one of the reasons why this book is appealing and why it was appealing to me to write. There, not to suggest there, it isn't important to report about soldiers in Iraq, but there is an exhaustion in some of the news that we that we tend to need to report because it's going on, but has a sense of continuity, a depressing sense of continuity. These, the same things are going on. And, and so as consumers of, of nonfiction, and fiction also, I think, we're looking for other stuff that'll satisfy that Jones. And science certainly fits that as we grapple with what's going on around us. I think we're doing a pretty good job. There's a lot of really amazing stuff out there. Yeah. Can, can I take a swipe at sure, this absolutely. one as well? Uh, one of the, um, char the, the main character in my novel, the, the hero, the hero uh, who's actually a heroine, it goes, is trying to get um, the media to pay attention to the story that she's telling. And she says, you know, she looks down at the, the cover of the, the newspaper, which is all about war and murder down by the river, and she says, you know, this is not new. This has been happening since for all of human history. What's new is what's happening on this planet for the first time in human history. That's news. And I think that uh, part of the, the challenge is that we have, I think the speaking or the writing is only as good as the listening and the, and the reading. And we have this assumption in our society that science is something that is done and understood by scientists. And in fact, I would argue that science is too important to leave to the scientists. And I think that we really have, I went to one of, you know, an excellent uh, university, uh, but I was a humanities major. And I feel that one of the, there was, my education was enormously deficient in not teaching me to be more science literate. And um, I think that we cannot, I mean, I think you've seen in the, the prior administration how when you have this kind of illiteracy of, around science in the populace, you can make fundamental political decisions ignoring the science to the detriment mm. of the entire society. So I think it's absolutely essential that uh, we increase the receptivity, the awareness, and the uh, ability to understand science so that, and I think that, so to your question about how are we doing in the science writing, I would say as a society we're doing very poorly in the educating and dissemination of that science to recognize that this is not some, a specialization. Science is about the world we live in. It's as imp and this marriage between the, the arts and the science, I think, is absolutely vital. And that's why it was so exciting and challenging to embark on a novel that tries to marry the creative arts and uh, science. So I but think as media, we're doing pretty well. And no, we're yet, we I, are, I, we disagree. Great. I disagree. I mean, I think there's more science media out there than there was 20 years ago. But I think um, a couple of things. One is I think it still is, you know, sort of uh, tends to get marginalized. I think that um, science moves at a different pace than other parts of, of yeah. the world. And there's this desire um, to constantly, you, it, the screw turns very slowly. But the news media wants things to move quickly. And so I think there's sort of this constant effort to you know, build up results in ways that aren't accurate, to make things look simpler than they are, to you know, disconnect what are very interconnected 
problems and issues. And then I think what ends up happening is you tack that on top of what's a fundamentally a scientifically illiterate population, and I'm as guilty as this as anybody, and people have, um, uh, you know, inaccurate expectations, um, skewed expectations, they don't really fully understand it, and it becomes very easy to manipulate people, as the Bush administration did, and it's, you know, profoundly anti-scientific policies. Um, and I think it, you know, I think we're facing problems that are really complicated and really hard, and they're not going to be, there's not quick, easy technological fixes, and we don't really understand that. I, so I, I don't think we're doing that well. I think there's more out there, but I'm still sort of frustrated by it, and I'm not a scientist. I mean, I'm just, Doug, yeah. you know. Well, I, I just, I have to tell you one quick story, and then I'd love yeah. to add something to your, so I was with Robert Reich, the former Clinton Labor Secretary, last weekend, and he told this story of he was on one of those shouting screamer talk shows, and into his earpiece, the, the producer said, get angrier. So <laughs> I love that we have no, a little bit yeah. of controversy here, but I don't think we're going to start shouting, but I, I do. You could, though. I, I'm, I, you know, I, this is very polite company, but <laughs> I, I would say that I think that uh, the problem with the way the news cycle works and the way that science cycle, which is yeah. what you were alluding yeah. to, is that they're fundamentally incompatible. And that the whole premise of, which has served uh, journalism extremely well, and I, I feel like I'm a bit of an uh, interlocutor here, you know, an imposter here with the three of you, but this premise of, well, we're gonna get the pros and we're gonna get the cons, mm -hmm. and we're going to give them equal weight, does not serve in a, in a scientific, in scientific reporting always. And I think that's what we saw with climate change for a long time, was there was like, well, these people say yes, these people say no, and in fact, when 99 say yes and one says no. Right, you get to find the one guy who, right, exactly. yeah. yeah. Um, May I just one absolutely. one thing in response? Yourself, sorry, I have to sorry, defend sorry. myself. Yeah, but first, yeah. I have to match your story with Robert Reich, which is that I, on another book I was invited on the Bill O'Reilly show. Speaking of your screamers, and yeah, it, yeah. that same earpiece was in my ear. And during the commercial prior to my segment, I heard, "Hello, Peter. Yeah, Bill here. Okay, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to make your point, and then I'm going to make fun of you." That was, that's what he told me during the commercial right prior to going on. So yes, the screaming is fun. Yeah. But I, I don't disagree with the two of you. I just feel that, that uh, the news cycle and to your question, what's out there are two different things. And too often as a society, we are relying on that news cycle, on those Bill O'Reilly's, and, and that the onus should be on the, the consumer. And when the onus is on the consumer, the material is there. That's and that's what I mean when I say that we're doing better. The, the, there, is, there, there is science stuff out there that's accessible if yes. the yes. consumer wishes to get it. I'd say that the science writing is actually quite that's superb. Yeah. 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 And I think the media coverage of, that, uh, of the science, unfortunately, uh, right, right. Yeah. Just I'll be a good moderator. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be a good moderator and jump. I mean, I think it's the best of times and worst of times in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, the best of times is that we do have the science literature has become a, a real genre, and you know everybody, you know, from from Dawkins to you know Carl, late Carl Sagan. I mean, there's there's wonderful writing yeah. both in fiction and nonfiction, and also in in, in magazines. I mean, you know, you pick up, uh, there, there's somewhat few and far between, but every year there are, you know, several dozen absolutely brilliant pieces. Um, the problem I have is that we are an illiterate country, scientific illiterate country, and the, it, goes way, it goes back to education. And the, 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 the issues I have, uh, you know, when I go to an editor with a s story, say, on, on uh, stem cells or, or the genetic impact of the environment, which is something I write on a lot, um, you get this sort of glazed look like, oh, we wrote about that last month. <laughs> and, you know, there's a, there's a sense that, um, you know, and climate change, actually as a story, uh, I was talking to an editor about this the other day, it's evolved from that criteria where, oh, we did a climate story, you know, last spring, we don't need to do another one, you know, how could it have changed that much, to suddenly now it's, it's 
you know, about every other day there's a climate story. It's a big deal because it's become much larger as a story. It's not just a science story. It's a political story, possibly the survival of our species. Um, but the, my, my biggest issue is, um, throughout the society, is, is educating people. And this is not, not just students, but also politicians, uh, people who have to make these decisions, business people, you know, all, all across the spectrum. And it does slowly happen. I mean, I think the, you know, the environmental movement is a good example of it took a generation, but it's, it's now sunk in much deeper than I, I would have ever imagined with my radical environmentalist mother growing up in the 60s and 70s. I mean, everybody thought she was insane. Yeah. We were in Kansas, too. She was the only <laughs> radical environmentalist, I think, in the entire Midwest at the time. But um, Communist recycler. <laughs> yes, yes. But, you know, her, her points of view have become mainstream now. So, you know, you do, you do have an evolution of these things, but um, we have to be constantly uh, working, especially to tell the story. And all of you had a common theme in that answer, which is um, it's about storytelling. And if you can tell a great story, and you know, scientists I know, you know, the, the likes of Craig Venner or James Watson, people like that, you know, writing about genetics, these people are crazy people. You know, they're fascinating characters. And I think that's one reason, one way to tell it. But let me, let me ask, in the, in the title of the talk here, um, the word humane was in there. You know, how do you make it real? How do you make it humane? And I always struggle with this a little bit because uh, in some ways science is, is, is what it is. Um, you know, it might be humane or it might not be. I mean, you know, if our sun goes nova, you know, there's nothing particularly humane about that, but, you know, it's just na nature at work. Do you all think that the two are actually compatible? You know, having a sense of being humane uh, and, and, you know, being true to the science? Yeah, I think it, go, it, it comes out in what you just said, that it's, it, for me, it's the characters, and that's where the humane and the human both are. And if, if the characters are rich and the story can be told to, through the voices and the actions of rich characters in intriguing places doing strange things, then, then that works, then that combines. Yeah. Anybody else want to... Uh, yeah, I, I would say uh, in my novel that science is part of the villainy and part of the heroism. I wanted to ask you about the villains. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it, I think that it's so much, uh, the empirical method is just the empirical method. It's just a process for, of inquiry. And it can be used for good or for ill, depending on the motivations of those who are. And it's amazing when you find some of the fraudulent, discover what's happening in terms of some of the fraudulent science and some of the commercially driven science uh, to demonstrate and prove points that justify certain profits. Uh, so I think that it's, as you said, the science itself is, um, is not you know, humanistic in the sense, you know, the scientific, but there is no reason that science and, uh, and humanism can't coexist. And one of my favorite characters in the novel uh, is a, a marine biologist based on a, a man named Roger Payne, who is, was the discoverer of whale song, that he discovered that humpback whales sing. And the, the novel starts out with a scene of a cello playing scientist who's playing along with the whale song. And this is actually, Roger Payne is a great cellist. And um, he is a model for me of a great scientist humanist. Someone who understands that while the conclusions that we draw from science may not be scientific, they are the point of science. And so the scientific method just takes us to discover the facts. And then the humanism and, and the humane quality of this then d is based on how we interpret those facts and what we do with those facts. And that remembering that always, I think, is vital. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I absolutely feel the two go side by side. I mean, I think, you know, as like most people got into journalism, I love stories. And, and stories are, you know, I think the essence of what make us human. Um, and what drew me into um, writing about the American chestnut was the, the underlying story of how people related to this tree and how people dealt with this disease and the pathogen and, um, and these kind of very quirky, eccentric individual characters. Um, I mean, I knew I wanted to do a book when I did a profile of this uh, biologist who's a chestnut breeder who 
loved chestnuts so much that when he was a graduate student in Bloomington, Indiana, he used to plant little chestnut seedlings and take them around to homeless communities. So he would give them to people who were you know, sleeping on the street and tell them, this will provide food for you one day. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, so you, ha I mean, you have to love people like that and, and the stories that go behind it. And I think that that's, I mean, actually, I think it's one of going back to the issue of how you have four people who didn't grow up as scientists doing this. In some ways, I think that gives us a great advantage in being able to see and make those connections. Yeah. Science, though, is famously a double-edged sword. I mean, it, it can give us wonders. It also, uh, you know, has the capacity these days to literally destroy us. Um, you know, probably atomic power being an example of that. Um, you know, how, how do we cope with those dangers? Uh, Susan, I may start with you, um, your next book on plastic. I mean, you know, how many things do you have in your pockets and in this room are made from plastic? And this is something I've researched a bit myself, too. I mean, they're finding fish whose, whose guts are half full of plastic and half full of food. And these, these little, they, they break down, they don't biodegrade, but they break down in these tiny little particles. And they're literally, we're drowning in it around the planet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have to cope with this at some point. You know, we, we've got to deal with it. I mean, we're trying to recycle things like that. But, I mean, how do we deal with something that really is a, one of the most wonderful materials ever created and makes our society possible in many ways? But how do we deal with this rather... Uh, steep uh, down, downward uh, decline that it may cause us later on. You know, I mean, that's a key question in my upcoming book. And I think, you know, plastic is the perfect poster child for this question. And it's interesting because you look at there, I think there's this growing realization that, that um, we have come to surround ourselves with these materials, which are wonders, but also, you know, could be potentially very dangerous. And the first thing that I see happening is technological fixes. You know, people are trying to figure out how to make bio-based plastics, get away from fossil fuels, how to make, um, uh, uh, you know, new methods of burning plastic. And it's this idea that somehow we can get out of this very, uh, th this technology that, you know, we greeted with such a sense of wonder through new technologies which bring their own uh, possible hazards. Um, and I think, you know, so one, I, one place I think you start is with a sense of humility that, you know, we may think that we're figuring it out, but are we really figuring out? In the case of plastics, I think it really does come back to an idea of, uh, you know, William McDonough's cradle to cradle. You, you don't put things out there that can't either be recycled uh, back technologically, you know, back into new valuable um, uh, the equipment or back to nature. Um, but I think, you know, I, in, in some ways, I also think it starts with us. I mean, in plastics, I think plastics enabled a tremendous, um, you know, sort of consumer fever that we're going to have to have to reckon with because it's also at the root of, you know, climate change to some extent as well. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't think science offers answers, but it's only as good as our ability to use it wisely. Yeah, let me bend a question just slightly more for, for, for you two guys. Um, you know, are, we, we are, as I said earlier, uh, you know, Homo sapien, the, the wise creature, the wise man, um, are, are, we, are we clever enough to actually overcome and solve the problems caused by our own cleverness? We don't know anything. I, mean, we, I think it's clear we don't know anything. And and uh, we named ourselves that, though, of course. We named ourselves <laughs> that. Yeah. But, but, In a modest moment. Yeah. Right. Modest moment, and we don't know what we're doing, and we think we know what we're doing, maybe, and we try to figure it out. And we certainly don't know here at this panel whether we're figuring it out properly and or at all. But, but there's, a, as there always is, an example out of the butterfly world. <laughs> and, and there really are examples in the butterfly world for most everything I'm learning to my great satisfaction. But there's a, there's a current controversy in the world of butterflies between the so-called, or my I call, the breeders and the huggers. And there are butterfly breeders. How, how many of you have been to a wedding or a funeral where butterflies have been released? And, and uh, one, and that, that's because this is a relatively new industry. And it is the breeding of butterflies and then the shipping of these butterflies in a holding pattern state to you for your event, often a wedding or a funeral. And then the butterflies are theoretically successfully released 
and they fly up to the heavens and symbolize what you wish them to symbolize. Within the butterfly community, to your question, there, there is this uh, controversy. Is this a wonderful use of this animal for our gratification and inspiration, or is it a perverted commodification and commercialization of something that's wild in nature with the possible negative effect of some kind of crossbreeding crisis that is a scientific horror. Nobody knows. And who regulates this? Uh, the government maybe slightly, if they're paying attention at the moment, will try to keep a company from doing one thing or another, and there are only certain butterflies that are supposed to be transshipped across state lines if they uh, are native to the state where they're going. But there we are, muddling along, doing this, without any idea what's going to happen. I'm guessing these are the same people that have the tigers down in Texas. <laughs> these are people flies. that are very much like <laughs> the people with tigers in Texas, but I have yet to find any weddings or funerals that are releasing tigers. <laughs> <laughs> there might be a law of diminishing returns on that. Yeah. Um, uh, Doug, I don't know if you have any comment on this idea. Yeah, well, this is, I think, an, a, a really important question, and one of the sub themes in the novel is the nature of intelligence, because I'm dealing with whale intelligence, animal intelligence, and had to work a lot with the different uh, scientists I work with to make sure I was treating whale intelligence as whale intelligence and not anthropomorphizing it as some kind of form of human intelligence. And so there's a, a fundamental question that runs through the novel, which is what is the nature of intelligence? And what is the relationship between our intelligence and the rest of intelligence in the biosphere? And Ultimately, what I came to was that the true definition of intelligence, a sapiens, is the ability to survive. And with that definition of intelligence, the experiment in human consciousness has, yet not, has not yet been proven successful. I mean, there are lots of species that are doing just fine with surviving in their environment, and we're not one of them. And so uh, I think that this is I, goes to the point of if we are going to really be homo sapiens, if we are really going to discover a wisdom uh, that is true to what we know about the biological world, it's about recognizing what you alluded to before, which is that we are connected not just in, a, in some kind of spiritual belief, but at a biochemical level. When we share 70 percent of our DNA with fruit flies, uh, and much more with other species, it, it's quite an enormous amount of hubris that has to be maintained to keep us from recognizing that what we do to them will ultimately be done to us. Um, we've talked a little bit about uh, politics and science here. Um, the Bush administration has been mentioned, and um, you know what I, what I would um, you know, say at least is, was a virtual war on science, um, at least where it fit in ideologically or politically um, with uh, that particular administration's goals. Um, however, uh, there's always a raging debate, and it happens more in Europe, um, um, because uh, you know, they, they tend to be uh, less uh, ideological than, than we are about science. But uh, is science, does it really represent truth? I mean, you know, as, as we've also said, there's, there's a certain fluidity to the scientific process. And a lot, if we had a scientist on the panel, um, you know, we, we could ask them to talk about that scientific method that, that a lot of people don't really understand, uh, you know, the hypothesis-driven kind of science that we have. And, and even evolution, which has, you know, been obviously uh, was, was a large part of what happened over the last eight, eight years, uh, creative uh, design versus evolution, et cetera. Um, you know, you, you, you have a situation where there's a misunderstanding of a basic uh, tenet of science, which is uh, your facts and truth are based on what the latest observations and evidence suggest, but, but they're, they're, they're mutable, they're, they're changeable. And how, how do we as communicators impart that we, we want both the facts, I mean, we want something like, uh, you know, there, there was a web website, I think it was uh, Health and Human Services, actually had up that um, um, abortions cause breast cancer, and there's absolutely no proof of that. But it was, it, they kept putting up this information, and then they would be told to take it down, they would take it down for a few days, uh, some of us were even monitoring this. Um, you know, but how do you impart to people that, um, now that may be a fact, but even that is ch potentially changeable based on evidence. How, how do we communicate that? How do you do it in fiction? 
How do you draw that line? Yeah, I, I think the, um, again, part of this goes back to the just fundamental illiteracy that I shared in, in embarking on this novel about what science is and, and what it can tell us. But I think that what you discover is that science is, um, you know, is this iterative process where you test, test something and you find a result and then you test it again and test it again. And that's part of what you were talking about with, with the problem with the news cycle where sometimes we will say, oh, this study has found this and so therefore that's the fact. And then ultimately we see that other studies show, show different things. One of uh, the, the, some of the research that I was looking at for this novel, and this goes back to the villainy issue a little bit, uh, was they were, I think it, w it was something like there were 93 studies that were done, how many of you have heard of BPA, a chemical, a plastic chemical that's very controversial right now? <laughs> uh, because that's of a its, surprise. Uh, because of its role in uh, affecting our biology, our physiology, and particularly in endocrine disruption. And so there were uh, 93 studies that were done by uh, educational institutions and government about 95% of them showed some powerful physiological effect. There were seven studies that were done by industry and none of them showed an effect. So I think what this, I'm kind of coming at your question in a slightly slanted way, which is that the science can be slanted and that we have to have a very careful understanding about what we mean by facts, uh, you know, and how we go about reporting on those facts, demonstrating those facts. Uh, and I think that in fiction, the particular challenge is you're, and, and you're always having to first serve the story. You know, it has to be a dramatic, exciting story. And I'm sure in some way in, in nonfiction that's the case as well. Uh, but even more in fiction, you know, the facts are considered peripheral. I mean, you've got, you know, Michael Crichton or others who would just say, well, damn, you know, like, you know, if the story needs dinosaurs, well, damn it, we'll have problem. dinosaurs. We'll, we'll clone uh, dinosaurs, even you know, though it's completely impossible. <laughs> no <basically>. problem. <laughs> uh, and so the challenge with doing fact-based fiction like this was riding that edge of, you had kind of two masters that I was serving at all times. One was serving the, you know, the story gods, the muse, and the other was serving the, sci the science and making sure that while I was, the storyline had to, had to cut its path between those two. Can now, I just... Yeah, let, let, just really quick, because I, I we oh, no, do need to go jump ahead. into questions from the audience, and if you all think about your questions, okay? So, no, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, in some ways, I, you know, the idea of, you know, being a bearer of truth feels a little like a bigger mantle than I particularly want to carry. Um, I mean, in, in, to some extent, I, I keep coming back to this idea of hubris, and which just is what seems to me keep tripping us up as a species. And so, um, you know, in the research that I'm doing now in the plastics book, one of the things that's interesting is that industry will say, um, uh, you know, there's this great debate about the chemicals that we're exposed to in everyday life in our everyday products, that, like, like Doug mentioned, of, of BPA. Um, and one of the arguments that industry has made to fight regulation has been um, that, you know, the, the idea that these are toxic at low levels and um, wreak havoc with the way our hormones operate has not been proven. Well, that's not how science operates. Science operates on disproving. And, um, but you know, it's, it's a very persuasive sounding argument and it's driven by a, an ideological position. And I have the luxury as somebody writing books and not reporting for a daily newspaper of being able to say, well, that's not the point of view I'm gonna take in the way that I want to write about this. Um, and I'm going to look at it in a different fashion. And you know, to me, it makes sense to be safer rather than sorry. And I don't have a vested interest in, you know, I don't own stock in BPA. So I guess <laughs> that's a little bit different than truth. But it feels to me, in a way, right in how you, you know, ultimately, it's an interpretive process. Yeah, I'm going to jump in here. And uh, we have a few, few minutes for questions. Uh, does anybody have any, any questions out there? Yes. One thing I want to say is we're talking about truth, we're talking about science, we're talking about literature. Without opening up this can of angels, what about science and spirituality as the you know the issue of scientists in universities, grant seeking universities, seeking funding, stature, security, and glory, and being willing to lie about certain things and ego being one of the things that, that hasn't been addressed, but it, it can't be thrown out of the equation here. 
Yeah, I partly wrote it, my last book before the current one is Experimental Man. The the one before that was called Masterminds, and it did it was all about ego and ambition. A lot of it. I mean, some wonderful scientists, but when you get like James Watson, you know Watson and Crick that discovered the shape of DNA, uh, a monstrous ego. And yeah, that's a huge, huge part of it. And ego, of course, can be used to one's advantage, too. I mean, if, if you come out at the end with um, something that's brilliant and, and helpful to society, you know, in some ways, uh, you might have to put up with the ego, but it does get in the way all the time. I mean, every single day. And in fact, some of the um, barriers right now in the, in the areas that I write about with genetics and environmental genetics and things um, is being blocked by uh, a system that rewards certain activities and ambitions and not others. And for instance, um, geneticists don't speak very much with environmental toxicologists and they're completely different fields yeah. and the ego and ambitions in each of the fields is, 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 is different and at a time when those two should be talking to each other. So it, it, can, it can be an impediment as well. Does anybody I, else want to? Yeah, I would add to, I saw an, a vivid example of this. I don't know if exactly ego, but the, at least the proprietariness of, of scientific inquiry and the dangers of that. Where I was down in Tonga swimming with the whales with a marine biologist and re, while researching the book. We saw some quite extraordinary whale behavior underwater. We were videotaping it, and I... You know, I just assumed that that would just be put on the web for every scientist to uh, to to learn about and discover and, and hypothesize and investigate. And it was like, oh no, no, that's my my data. And yep. this yep. sense of you know, where as you're saying, ego and um, ambition get in the way of discovery. How about some good news? Okay, there's a guy that I dealt with. Uh, trying to get some kind of sense of understanding of flight dynamics of butterflies. And he is one of the world's leading experts on flight dynamics in general, and particularly the flight dynamics of butterflies. And, and the line of questioning started to go into the replication of this and how there might be something to learn for human flight and for unmanned flight. And, and he said that there's an extraordinary amount of money out there Defense Department money for that very purpose, and that he refuses to engage, takes none of it, even though it's just on the table because he will have nothing to do with transferring as best he can protect it, what he's learning into that world. Mm. Yeah. That was nice when I met him. I like that. I walked <laughs> nice away from that. I like nice science stories. Yeah. Um, let's go to another question. Um, in the back. <laughs> and, and then he said, you know, prior to that, we had something called truth. And then, and then after the fact, uh, we have these things called uh, information and then and the data. Mm -hmm. And then it's so hard to, to pose the question, what's next? But uh, every time I, I, I see a science debate on television, uh, it, it looks like two sides tend to fall in the two camps. One side says, uh, you know, there's absolutely no evidence to suggest. And the other side says, what we need is more money to study this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and at which point, you know, we're at this crossroads, it seems, between uh, uh, the intersection of politics and science, uh, science and truth. And just wanted to get your comments. I'll just answer that really quickly because that's one of the areas that I study is policy. And then Jane is, is already up here, I think, to... Giving you the high sign. Yes, giving the high sign. Um, I think that, that that tension between those two um, areas has been going on probably forever. Um, I mean, I, you know, Galileo uh, you know, would go to the city fathers in Florence and, and say, you know, I need more money to study that. And then other people would say, you're full, you know, you're full of it. And I think that's been going on forever. And hopefully it will continue because that's exactly what drives scientific inquiry and gives us uh, material to write about. So with that. Yeah. With that, I want to thank you so much, David Ewing Duncan, Peter Laufer, Susan Frankel, and Douglas Carlton Abrams from your, for your fantastic panel. This was really fascinating. And uh, please come back in about five minutes. We're going to start another panel called The Value of the Essay in the 21st Century. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Very and much. Thank you.
great. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun. That was fun. I enjoyed that very much. That was great. Yeah.